We clung to the swinging net like a tribe of monkeys, bumping clumsily down the rock face while the pulley squealed and the rope creaked. Coming to earth in a knotted pile, we extricated ourselves from its tangles in what could have been a lost Three Stooges bit. Several times I thought I was free, only to try standing and fall flat on my face again with a cartoonish woomph. The dead hollow lay just feet away. Its tentacles splayed like starfish arms from beneath the boulder that had crushed it. I almost felt embarrassed for it. That such a fearsome creature had let itself be laid low by the likes of us. Next time, if there was a next time, I didn't think we'd be so lucky. We tiptoed around the hollow's reeking carcass, charged down the mountain as fast as we could, given the limits of the treacherous path and Bronwyn's volatile cargo. Once we'd reached flat land, we were able to follow our own tracks back through the squishy moss of the forest floor. We found the lake again just as the sun was setting and bats were screeching out of their hidden roosts. They seemed to bear some unintelligible warning from the world of night, crying and circling overhead as we splashed through the shallows toward the stone giant. We climbed up to his mouth and pitched ourselves down his throat, then swam out the back of him into the instantly cooler water and brighter light of midday, September 1940. The others surfaced around me, squealing and holding their ears, everyone feeling the pressure that accompanied quick temporal shifts. It's like an airplane taking off, I said, working my jaw to release the air. Never flown in an airplane, said Horace, brushing water from the brim of his hat. Or when you're on the highway and someone rolls down a window, I said. What's a highway? asked Olive. Forget it. Emma shushed us. Listen. In the distance, I could hear dogs barking. They seemed far away, but sound traveled strangely in deep woods, and distances could be deceiving. We'll have to move quickly, Emma said. Until I say different, no one make a sound. And that includes you, headmistress. I'll throw an exploding egg at the first dog that gets near us, said Hugh. That'll teach him to chase peculiars. Don't you dare, said Bronwyn. Mishandle one egg and you're liable to set them all off. We waded out of the lake and started back through the forest. Millard navigating with Miss Wren's creased map. After half an hour, we came to the dirt road Addison had pointed to from the top of the tower. We stood in the ruts of an old wagon track while Millard studied the map, turning it sideways, squinting at its microscopic markings. I reached into the pocket of my jeans for my phone, thinking I'd call up a map of my own, an old habit then found myself tapping on a blank rectangle of glass that refused to light up. It was dead, of course, wet, chargeless, and fifty years from the nearest cell tower. My phone was the only thing I owned that had survived our disaster at sea, but it was useless here, an alien object. I tossed it into the woods. Thirty seconds later, I felt a pang of regret and ran to retrieve it. For reasons that weren't entirely clear to me, I wasn't quite ready to let it go. Millard folded his map and announced that the town was to our left. A five or six hour walk, at least. If we want to arrive before dark, we'd better move quickly. We hadn't been walking long when Bronwyn noticed a cloud of dust rising on the road behind us, way in the distance. Someone's coming, she said. What should we do? Millard removed his greatcoat and threw it into the weeds by the side of the road, making himself invisible. I recommend you make yourselves disappear, he said, in whatever limited way you are able. We got off the road and crouched behind a screen of brush. The dust cloud expanded 
and with it came a clatter of wooden wheels and the clip-clop of horses' hooves. It was a caravan of wagons. When they emerged, clanking and rumbling from the dust and began to pass us, I saw Horace gasp and Olive break into a smile. These were not the gray, utilitarian wagons I'd gotten used to seeing on Cairnholm, but like something from a circus, painted every color of the rainbow, sporting ornately carved roofs and doors, pulled by long-maned horses, and driven by men and women whose bodies fluttered with beaded necklaces and bright scarves. Remembering Emma's stories of performing and traveling sideshows with Miss Peregrine and the others, I turned to her and asked, Are they peculiar? They're Romani, she replied. Is that good news or bad? She narrowed her eyes. Dunno yet. I could see her weighing a decision, and I was pretty sure I knew what it was. The town we were heading for was far away, and these wagons were moving a lot faster than we could ever travel on foot. With whites and dogs hunting us, the extra speed might mean the difference between getting caught and getting away. But we didn't know who these Romani were, or whether we could trust them. Emma looked at me. What do you think? Should we hitch a ride? I looked at the wagons, looked back at Emma, thought about how my feet would feel after a six-hour walk and still wet shoes. Absolutely, I said. Signaling to the others, Emma pointed at the last wagon and mimed running after it. It was shaped like a miniature house, with a little window on each side and a platform that jutted from the back like a porch, probably just wide and deep enough to hold all of us if we squeezed tight together. The wagon was moving fast, but not faster than we could sprint. So when it had passed us and we were out of the last driver's sight, we leapt out of the brush and scurried after it. Emma climbed on first, then held out a hand for the next person. One by one, we pulled ourselves up and settled into cramped positions along the wagon's rear porch, careful to do so quietly, lest the driver hear us. We rode like that for a long time until our ears rang with the clatter of wagon wheels and our clothes were caked with dust, until the midday sun had wheeled across the sky and dipped behind the trees, which rose up like the walls of a great green canyon on either side of us. I scanned the forest constantly, afraid that at any moment the whites and their dogs would burst out and attack us, but for hours we didn't see anyone. Not a white, not even another traveler. It was as if we'd arrived in an abandoned country. Now and then the caravan would stop and we'd all hold our breath, ready to flee or fight, sure we were about to be discovered. We'd send Millard out to investigate, and he would creep down from the wagon only to find that the Roma were just stretching their legs or reshoeing a horse, and then we'd start moving again. Eventually, I stopped worrying about what would happen if we were discovered. The Romani seemed road-weary and harmless. We'd pass as normal and appeal to their pity. We're just orphans with no home, we'd say. Please, could you spare a morsel of bread? With any luck, they'd give us dinner and escort us to the train station. It wasn't long before my theory was put to the test. The wagons pulled abruptly off the road and shuddered to a stop in a small clearing. The dust had hardly settled when a large man came striding around back of our wagon. He wore a flat cap on his head, a caterpillar mustache below his nose, and a grim expression that pulled down the corners of his mouth. Bronwyn hid Miss Peregrine inside her coat while Emma leapt off the wagon and did her best impression of a pathetic orphan. Sir, we throw ourselves at your mercy. Our house was hit by a bomb, you see, and our parents are dead and we're terribly lost. Shut your gob, the man boomed. Get down from there, all of you. It was a command, not a request, emphasized by the decorative but deadly looking knife balanced in his hand. We looked at one another, unsure what to do. 
Should we fight him and run, and probably give away our secret in the process, or play normal for a while longer and wait to see what he does? Then dozens more of them appeared, piling out of their wagons to range around us in a wide circle, many holding knives of their own. We were surrounded, our options dramatically narrowed. The men were grizzled and sharp-eyed, dressed in dark, heavy-knit clothes built to hide layers of road dust. The women wore bright, flowing dresses, their long hair held back by scarves. Children gathered behind and between them. I tried to square what little I knew about Romani with the faces before me. Were they about to massacre us, or were they just naturally grumpy? I looked to Emma for a cue. She stood with her hands pressed to her chest, not held out like she was about to make flame. If she wasn't going to fight them, I decided, then neither was I. I got down from the wagon like the man had asked, hands above my head. Horace and Hugh did the same, and then the others, all but Millard, who had slipped away unseen, presumably to lurk nearby, waiting and watching. The man with the cap, whom I'd pegged as their leader, began to fire questions at us. Who are you? Where do you come from? Where are your elders? We come from the west, Emma said calmly. An island off the coast. We're orphans, as I already explained. Our houses were smashed by bombs in an air raid, and we were forced to flee. We rode all the way to the mainland and nearly drowned. She attempted to manufacture some tears. We have nothing, she sniffled. We've been lost in the woods for days with no food to eat and no clothes but the ones we have on. We saw your wagons passing, but were too frightened to show ourselves. We only wanted to ride as far as the town. The man studied her, his frown deepening. Why were you forced to flee your island after your house was bombed? And why did you run into the woods instead of following the coast? Enoch spoke up. No choice. We were being chased. Emma gave him a sharp look that said, Let me do this. Chased by who? asked the leader. Bad men, Emma said. Men with guns, added Horace. Dressed like soldiers, although they aren't really. A woman in a bright yellow scarf stepped forward. If soldiers are after them, they're trouble we don't need. Send them away, back here. Or tie them to trees and leave them, said a rangy-looking man. No, cried Olive. We have to get to London before it's too late. The leader cocked an eyebrow. Too late for what? We hadn't aroused his pity, only his curiosity. We'll do nothing until we find out who you are, he said. And what you're worth. Ten men holding long-bladed knives marched us toward a flatbed wagon with a big cage mounted on top of it. Even from a distance, I could see that it was something meant for animals, twenty feet by ten, made of thick iron bars. You're not going to lock us in there, are you? Olive said. Just until we sort out what to do with you, said the leader. No, you can't, cried Olive. We have to get to London, and quick. And why is that? One of us is ill, said Emma, shooting Hugh a meaningful look. We need to get him to a doctor. You don't need to go all the way to London for no doctor, said one of the Roma men. Dubai is a doctor, ain't you, Jubiah? A man with a scabrous lesion spanning his cheeks stepped forward. Which one of you is ill? Hugh needs a specialist, said Emma. He's got a rare condition. Stinging cough. Hugh put a hand to his throat as if it hurt him and coughed, and a bee shot out of his mouth. Some of the Romani gasped, and a little girl hid her face in her mother's skirt. It's some sort of trick, said the so-called doctor. Enough, said their leader. Get in the cage, all of you. 
They shoved us toward a ramp that led to it. We clustered together at the bottom. No one wanted to go first. We can't let them do this, whispered Hugh. What are you waiting for? Enoch hissed at Emma. Burn them! Emma shook her head and whispered, There are too many. She led the way up the ramp and into the cage. Its barred ceiling was low, its floor piled deep with rank-smelling hay. When we were all inside, the leader slammed the door and locked it behind us, slipping the key into his pocket. No one goes near them, he shouted to anyone within earshot. They could be witches, or worse. Yes, that's what we are, Enoch said through the bars. Now let us go, or we'll turn your children into warthogs. The leader laughed as he walked away down the ramp. Meanwhile, the other Romani retreated to a safe distance and began to set up camp, pitching tents and starting cook fires. We sank down into the hay, feeling defeated and depressed. Look out, Horace warned. There are animal droppings everywhere. Oh, what does it matter, Horace? Emma said. No one gives a chuck if your clothes are dirty. I do, Horace replied. Emma covered her face with her hands. I sat down next to her and tried to think of something encouraging to say, but came up blank. Bronwyn opened her coat to give Miss Peregrine some fresh air and Enoch knelt beside her and cocked his ear as if listening for something. Hear that? he said. What? Bronwyn replied. The sound of Miss Peregrine's life slipping away. Emma, you should have burned those Romani's faces off while you had the chance. We were surrounded, Emma said. Some of us would have gotten hurt in a big fight. Maybe killed. I couldn't risk that. So you risked Miss Peregrine instead, said Enoch. Enoch, leave her be, said Bronwyn. It ain't easy, deciding for everyone. We can't take a vote every time there's a choice to be made. Then maybe you should let me decide for everyone, Enoch replied. Hugh snorted. We would have been killed ages ago if you were in charge. Look, it doesn't matter now, I said. We have to get out of this cage and make it to that town. We're a lot closer now than if we hadn't hitched a ride in the first place. So there's no need to cry over milk that hasn't even spilled yet. We just need to think of a way to escape. So we thought, and came up with lots of ideas, but none that seemed workable. Maybe Emma can burn through this floor, Bronwyn suggested. It's made of wood. Emma swept a clear patch in the hay and knocked on the floor. It's too thick, she said miserably. When can you bend these bars apart? I asked. Maybe, she replied. But not with those Romani so close by. They'll see and come running with their knives again. We need to sneak out, not break out, said Emma. Then we heard a whisper from outside the bars. Did you forget about me? Millard! Olive exclaimed, nearly floating out of her shoes with excitement. Where have you been? Getting the lay of the land, as it were, and waiting for things to calm down. Think you can steal the key for us? said Emma, rattling the cage's locked door. I saw the head man put it in his pocket. Prowling and purloinment are my specialty, he assured us, and with that, he slipped away. The minutes crawled by, then a half hour, then an hour. Hugh paced the length of the cage, an agitated bee circling his head. What's taking him so long? He grumbled. If he doesn't come back soon, I'm going to start tossing eggs, said Enoch. Do that and you'll get us all killed, said Emma. We're sitting ducks in here. Once the smoke clears, they'll flay us alive. So we sat and waited more, watching the Romani, the Romani watching back. Every minute that ticked by felt like another nail in Miss Peregrine's coffin. 
I found myself staring at her, as if by looking closely enough I might be able to detect the changes happening to her, to see the still human spark within her slowly winking out. But she looked the same as she always had, only calmer somehow, asleep in the hay next to Bronwyn, her small, feathered chest rising and falling softly. She seemed to have no awareness of the trouble we were in, or of the countdown that was hanging over her head. Maybe the fact that she could sleep at a time like this was evidence enough that she was changing. The old Miss Peregrine would have been having nervous fits. Then my thoughts strayed to my parents, as they always did when I didn't keep a tight rein on them. I tried to picture their faces as I'd last seen them. Bits and pieces coalesced in my mind. The thin rim of stubble my dad had developed after a few days on the island. The way my mom, without realizing it, would fiddle with her wedding ring when my dad talked too long about something that disinterested her. My dad's darting eyes, always checking the horizon on his never-ending search for birds. Now they'd be searching for me. As evening settled in, the camp came alive around us. The Romani talked and laughed, and when a band of children with battered horns and fiddles struck up a song, they danced. Between songs, one of the boys from the band snuck around the back of our cage with a bottle in his hands. It's for the sick one, he said, checking behind him nervously. Who? I said and then he nodded at Hugh, who wilted to the floor in spasms of coughing right on cue. The boy slipped the bottle through the bars. I twisted off the cap, gave it a sniff, and nearly fell over. It smelled like turpentine mixed with compost. What is it? I said. Works. That's all that I know. He looked behind him again. All right. I done something for you, now you owes. So tell me, what crime did you do? You thieves, ain't you? Then he lowered his voice and said, Or did you kill someone? What's he talking about? said Bronwyn. We didn't kill anyone, I came close to saying, but then an image of Golan's body tumbling through the air toward a battery of rocks flashed in my mind, and I kept quiet. Emma said it for me instead. We didn't kill anyone. Well, you must have done something, the boy said. Why else would they have a reward out for you? There's a reward, said Enoch. Sure as rain, they're offering a whole pile of money. Who is? The boy shrugged. Are you going to turn us in? Olive asked. The boy twisted his lip. Don't know if we will or we won't. The big shots are chewing it over, though I'll say they don't must trust the sort of people who's offering the reward. Then again, money's money, and they don't much like it that you won't answer their questions. Where we come from, Emma said haughtily, you don't question people who come to you asking for help. And you don't put them in cages either, said Olive. Just then, a tremendous bang went off in the middle of the camp. The Roma boy lost his balance and fell off the ramp into the grass, and the rest of us ducked as pots and pans went flying through the air away from a cook fire. The Romani woman who'd been tending it sped off screaming bloody murder, her dress on fire, and she might have run all the way to the ocean if someone hadn't picked up a horse's drinking bucket and doused her with it. A moment later, we heard the footsteps of an invisible boy pounding up the ramp outside our cage. That's what happens when you try and make an omelet from a peculiar chicken egg, said Millard, out of breath and laughing. You did that, said Horace. Everything was too orderly and quiet. Bad weather for pickpocketing, so I slipped one of our eggs in with theirs, and voila. Millard made a key appear out of thin air. People are much less likely to notice my hand in their pockets when dinner's just exploded in their faces. Took you long enough, said Enoch. Now let us out of here. 
But before Millard could get the key in the door, the Roma boys stood up and shouted, Help! They're trying to get away! The boy had heard everything, but in the confusion following the blast, hardly anyone noticed his shouts. Millard twisted the key in the lock. The door wouldn't open. Oh, trat, he said. Perhaps I stole the wrong key? Ah, the boy screamed, pointing at the space Millard's voice emanated from. A ghost! Will someone please shut him up, said Enoch. Bronwyn obliged, reaching through the cage to grab the boy's arms, then pulling him off his feet and up against the bars. Help! he screamed. They've gotten... She slapped a hand over his mouth, but she'd silenced him too late. Galby! a woman shouted. Let him go, you savages! And suddenly, without really meaning to, we'd taken a hostage. Romani men rushed at us, knives flashing in the failing light. "'What are you doing?' cried Millard. "'Let that boy go before they murder us!' "'No, don't,' Emma said, and then she screamed, "'Free us, or the boy dies!' The Romani surrounded us, shouting threats. "'If you harm him in any way,' the leader yelled, "'I'll kill every last one of you with my bare hands. "'Stay back!' Emma said, just let us go and we won't hurt anyone. One of the men made a run at the cage and instinctively Emma flicked out her hands and sparked a roaring fireball between them. The crowd gasped and the man skidded to a stop. Now you've done it, hissed Enoch. They'll hang us for being witches. I'll burn the first one that tries, Emma shouted widening the space between her palms to make the fireball even larger. Come on, let's show them who they're messing with. It was time to put on a show. Bronwyn went first. With one hand, she raised the boy even higher, his feet kicking in the air. And with the other, she grabbed one of the roof bars and began to bend it. Hugh stuck his face between the bars and shot a line of bees from his open mouth. And then Millard, who'd sprinted away from the cage the moment the boy had noticed him, shouted from somewhere behind the crowd, And if you think you can contend with them, you haven't met me! And launched an egg into the air. It arced above their heads and landed in a nearby clearing with a huge bang, scattering dirt as high as the treetops. As the smoke cleared, There was a breathless moment in which no one moved or spoke. I thought at first that our display had paralyzed the Romani with awe, but then, when the ringing in my ears had faded, I realized they were listening for something. Then I was, too. From the darkening road came the sound of an engine. A pair of headlights flickered into view beyond the trees along the road. Everyone, Romani and Peculiar, watched as the lights passed the turnoff to our clearing, then slowed, then came back. A canvas-topped military vehicle rumbled towards us. From inside it, the sounds of angry voices shouting and dogs, their throats hoarse from barking, but unable to stop now that they'd caught our scent again. It was the whites who'd been hunting us, and here we were inside a cage, unable even to run. Emma extinguished her flame with a clap of her hands. Bronwyn dropped the boy and he stumbled away. The Romani fled back to their wagons or into the woods. In moments we were left alone, seemingly forgotten. Their leader strode towards us. Open the cage, Emma begged him. She was ignored. Hide yourselves under the hay and don't make a sound, the man said. And no magic tricks, unless you'd rather go with them. There was no time for more questions. The last thing we saw before everything went black were two Romani men running at us with a tarp in their hands. They flipped it over the top of our cage. Instant night. Boots tromped by outside the cage, Heavy and thudding, 
as if the whites sought to punish the very ground they walked upon. We did as instructed and dug ourselves into the stinking hay. Nearby, I heard a white talking to the Roma leader. A group of children were seen along the road this morning, the white said. His voice clipped, accent obscure, not quite English, not quite German. There's a reward for their capture. We haven't run across anyone all day, sir, the leader said. Don't let their innocent faces fool you. They're traitors to the war effort. Spies for Germany. The penalty for hiding them. We aren't hiding anything, the leader said gruffly. See for yourself. I'll do that, said the white. And if we find them here, I'll cut your tongue out and feed it to my dog. The white stomped away. Don't. Even breathe, the leader hissed at us, and then his footsteps trailed away, too. I wondered why he would lie for us, given the harm these whites could cause his people. Maybe it was out of pride, or some deep-rooted disdain for authority, or, I thought with a cringe, maybe... The Romani just wanted the satisfaction of killing us themselves. All around us we could hear the whites spreading throughout the camp, kicking things over, throwing open caravan doors, shoving people. A child screamed and a man reacted angrily, but was cut short with the sound of wood meeting flesh. It was excruciating to lie there and listen to people suffer, even if those same people had been ready to tear us limb from limb just minutes ago. From the corner of my eye, I saw Hugh rise from the hay and crawl to Bronwyn's trunk. He slipped his fingers over the latch and began to open the lid, but Bronwyn stopped him. What are you doing? she mouthed. We've got to get them before they get us. Emma lifted herself out of the hay on her elbows and rolled towards them, and I got closer, too, to listen. Don't be insane, said Emma. If we throw the eggs now, they'll shoot us to ribbons. So what, then, said Hugh? We should just lie here until they find us? We clustered around the trunk, speaking in whispers. Wait until they unlock the door, said Enoch. Then I'll throw an egg through the bars behind us. That'll distract the whites long enough for Bronwyn to crack the skull of whichever one comes into the cage first, which should give the rest of us time to run, scatter to the outer edges of the camp, then turn and throw our eggs back at the middlemost campfire. Everyone in a 30-meter radius will be a memory. I'll be damned, said Hugh. That might just work. But there are children in the camp, said Bronwyn. Enoch rolled his eyes. Or we can worry about collateral damage, run into the woods, and leave the whites and their dogs to hunt us down one by one. But if we plan on reaching London, or living beyond a night, I don't recommend it. Hugh patted Bronwyn's hand, which was covering the trunk latch. Open it, he said. Give them out. Bronwyn hesitated. I can't. I can't kill children who've done nothing to harm us. But we don't have a choice, whispered Hugh. You always have a choice, said Bronwyn. Then we heard a dog snarl very near the bottom rim of the cage and went silent. A moment later, a flashlight shone against the outside of the tarp. Tear the sheet down, someone said. The dog's handler, I assumed. The dog barked, its nose snuffling to get beneath the tarp and through the cage bars. Over here, shouted the handler. We've got something. We all looked to Bronwyn. Please, Hugh said. At least let us defend ourselves. It's the only way, said Enoch. Bronwyn sighed and took her hand away from the latch. 
Hugh nodded gratefully and opened the trunk lid. We all reached in and took an egg from between the layered sweaters, everyone but Bronwyn. Then we stood and faced the cage door, eggs in hand, and prepared for the inevitable. More boots marched towards us. I tried to prepare myself for what was coming. Run, I told myself. Run, and don't look back, and then throw it. But knowing that innocent people would die, could I really do it? Even to save my own life? What if I just dropped the egg in some grass and ran into the woods? A hand grabbed one edge of the tarp and pulled. The tarp began to slide away. Then, just shy of exposing us, it stopped. What's the matter with you? I heard the dog's handler say. I'd steer well away from that cage if I was you, said another voice. A Romani I could see half the sky above us, stars twinkling down through the branches of oaks. Yeah, and why is that? said the handler. Old Bloodcoat ain't been fed in a few days, Zurama said. He don't usually care for the taste of humans, but when he's this hungry, he ain't so discriminating. Then came a sound that stole the breath right out of me. The roar of a giant bear. And possibly, it seemed to be coming from amongst us, inside our cage. I heard the dog's handler shout in surprise and then scramble down the ramp, pulling his yelping dog along with him. I couldn't fathom how a bear had gotten into the cage, only that I needed to get away from it. So I pressed myself hard against the bars, Next to me, I saw Olive stick her little fist in her mouth to keep from crying out. Outside, other soldiers were laughing at the handler. Idiot, he said, embarrassed. Only Romani would keep an animal like that in the middle of their camp. I finally worked up the courage to turn around and look behind me. There was no bear in our cage. What had made that awful roar? The soldiers kept searching the camp but now they left our cage alone. After a few minutes, we heard them pile back into their truck and restart the engine, and then, at last, they were gone. The tarp slid away from our cage. The Romani were all gathered around us. I held my egg in one trembling hand, wondering if I'd have to use it. The leader stood before us. Are you all right? he said. I'm sorry if that frightened you. We're alive, Emma replied, looking around warily. But where's this bear of yours? You aren't the only ones with unusual talents, said a young man at the edge of the crowd. And then, in quick succession, he growled like a bear and yowled like a cat, throwing his voice from one place to another with slight turns of his head so that it sounded like we were being stalked from all directions. When we'd gotten over our shock, we broke into applause. I thought you said they weren't peculiar, I whispered to Emma. Anyone can do parlor tricks like that, she said. Apologies if I failed to properly introduce myself, said the Romani leader. My name is Bakir Bakmanathal. And you are our honored guest, he bowed deeply. Why didn't you tell us you were Sindragasti? We gaped at him. He had used the ancient name for peculiars, the one Miss Peregrine had taught us. Do we know you from somewhere? Bronwyn asked. Where did you hear that word? said Emma. Bakir smiled. If you'll accept our hospitality, I promise to explain everything. Then he bowed again and strode forward to unlock our cage. We sat with the Romani on fine, hand-woven carpets, talking and eating stew by the shimmering light of twin campfires. I dropped the spoon I'd been given and slurped straight from a wooden bowl, my table manners a distant memory as greasy, delicious broth dribbled down my chin. Bakir walked among us, 
making sure each peculiar child was comfortable, asking if we had enough to eat and drink, and apologizing repeatedly for the state of our clothes, now covered in filthy bits of hay from the cage. Since witnessing our peculiar display, he changed his attitude towards us completely. In the span of a few minutes, we'd graduated from being prisoners to guests of honor. I'm very sorry for the way you were treated, he said, lowering himself onto a cushion between the fires. When it comes to the safety of my people, I must take every precaution. There are many strangers wandering the roads these days, people who aren't what they appear to be. If you'd only told me you were Sindragasti, we were taught never, ever to tell anyone, said Emma. Ever, Olive added. Whoever taught you that is very wise, Bahir said. How do you know about us? Emma asked. You speak the old tongue. Only a few words, Bahir said. He gazed into the flames, a spit of darkening meat roasting there. We have an old understanding, your people and mine. We aren't so different, outcast and wanderers all, souls clinging to the margins of the world. He pinched a hunk of meat from the spit and chewed it thoughtfully. We are allies of a sort. Over the years, we Romani have even taken in and raised some of your children. And we're grateful for it, said Emma and for your hospitality as well. But at the risk of seeming rude, we can't possibly stay with you any longer. It's very important that we reach London quickly. We have a train to catch. For your sick friend? Bikir asked, raising an eyebrow at Hugh, who had long ago dropped his act and was now gulping down stew with abandon, bees buzzing happily around his head. Something like that, said Emma. Bekir knew we were hiding something, but he was kind enough to let us have our secrets. There won't be any more trains tonight, he said, but we'll rise at dawn and deliver you to the station before the first one leaves in the morning. Good enough? It'll have to be, Emma said, her brow pinched with worry even though we'd save time by hitching a ride instead of walking. Miss Peregrine had still lost an entire day. Now she had only two left, at most. But that was in the future. Right now we were warm, well-fed, in doubt of immediate danger. It was hard not to enjoy ourselves, if only for the moment. We made fast friends with the Romani, Everyone was eager to forget what had happened between us earlier. Bronwyn tried to apologize to the boy she'd taken hostage, but he'd brushed it off like it had meant nothing. The Romani fed us relentlessly, refilling my bowl again and again, overfilling it when I tried to refuse more. When Miss Peregrine hopped out of Bronwyn's coat and announced her appetite with a screech, the Romani fed her too, tossing hunks of raw meat in the air and cheering when she leapt up to snatch them. She's hungry, Olive laughed, clapping as the bird shredded a pig knuckle with her talons. Now aren't you glad we didn't blow them up? Bronwyn whispered to Enoch. Oh, I suppose, he replied. The Romani band struck up another song. We ate and danced. I convinced Emma to take a turn around the fire with me, and though I was usually shy about dancing in public, this time I let myself go. Our feet flew and our hands clapped in time to the music, and for a few shining minutes we lost ourselves in it. I was able to forget how much danger we were in, and how that very day we had nearly been captured by whites and devoured by a hollow our meat-stripped bones spat off a mountainside. In that moment, I was deeply grateful to the Romani and for the simple-mindedness of the animal part of my brain that a hot meal and a song and a smile from someone I cared about could be enough to distract me from all that darkness, if only for a little while. 
Then the song ended and we stumbled back to our seats, and in the lull that followed I felt the mood change. Emma looked at Bakir and said, May I ask you something? Of course, he said. Why did you risk your lives for us? He waved his hand. You would have done the same. I'm not sure we would have, said Emma. I just want to understand. Was it because we're peculiar? Yes, he said simply. A moment passed. He looked away at the trees that edged our clearing, their firelit trunks and the blackness beyond. Then he said, Would you like to meet my son? Of course, Emma said. She stood, and so did I and several others. Bekir raised a hand. He's shy, I'm afraid. Just you, he said, pointing to Emma. And you, he pointed at me. And the one who can be heard but not seen. Impressive, said Millard. And I was trying so hard to be subtle. Enoch sat down again. Why am I always being left out of things? Do I smell? A Romani woman in a flowing robe swept into the campfire circle. While they're gone, I'll read your palms and tell your fortunes, she said. She turned to Horace. Maybe you'll climb Kilimanjaro one day. Then to Bronwyn. Or marry a rich, handsome man. Bronwyn snorted. My fondest dream. The future is my specialty, madam, said Horace. Let me show you how it's done. Emma, Millard, and I left them and started across the camp with Bakir. We came to a plain-looking caravan wagon, and he climbed its short ladder and knocked on the door. Roddy, he called gently. Come out, please. There are people here to see you. The door opened a crack, and a woman peeked out. He's scared, won't leave his chair. She looked us over carefully, then opened the door wide and beckoned us in. We mounted the steps and ducked into a cramped but cozy space that appeared to be a living room, bedroom, and kitchen all in one. There was a bed under a narrow window, a table and a chair, and a little stove that vented out a chimney in the roof. Everything you'd need to be self-sufficient on the road for weeks or months at a time. In the room's lone chair sat a boy. He held a trumpet in his lap. I'd seen him play earlier, I realized, as part of the Roma children's band. This was Bakir's son. And the woman, I assumed, was Bakir's wife. Take off your shoes, Roddy, the woman said. The boy kept his gaze trained on the floor. Do I have to? he asked. Yes, Vikir said. The boy tugged off one of his boots, then the other. For a second I wasn't sure what I was seeing. There was nothing inside his shoes. He appeared to have no feet. And yet he'd had to work to get his boots off so they had to have been attached to something. Then Bakir asked him to stand, and reluctantly the boy slid forward in the chair and rose out of it. He seemed to be levitating, the cuffs of his pants hanging empty a few inches above the floor. He began disappearing a few months ago, the woman explained. First just his toes, then his heels, finally the rest both feet. Nothing I've given him. No tincture, no tonic, has had the slightest effect in curing him. So he had feet, after all. Invisible ones. We don't know what to do, said Bakir. But I thought, perhaps there's a healer among you. There's no healing what he's got, said Millard. And at the sound of his voice in the empty air, the boy's head jerked up. We're alike, he and I. It was just the same for me when I was young. I wasn't born invisible. It happened a little at a time. Who's speaking? 
the boy said. Millard picked up a scarf that lay on the edge of the bed and wrapped it around his face, revealing the shape of his nose, his forehead, his mouth. Here I am, he said, moving across the floor toward the boy. Don't be frightened. As the rest of us watched, the boy reached up his hand and touched Millard's cheek, then his forehead, then his hair, the color and style of which it had never occurred to me to imagine, and even pulled a little hank of it gently, as if testing its realness. You're there, the boy said, his eyes sparkling with wonder. You're really there. And you'll be, too even after the rest of you goes, said Millard. You'll see. It doesn't hurt. The boy smiled, and when he did, the woman's knees wobbled, and she had to steady herself against Bakir. Bless you, she said to Millard, near tears. Bless you. Millard sat down at Roddy's disappeared feet. There's nothing to be afraid of, my boy. In fact, once you adjust to invisibility, I think you'll find it has many advantages. And as he began to list them, Bagheer went to the door and nodded at Emma and me. Let's let them be, he said. I'm sure they have a lot to talk about. We left Millard alone with the boy and his mother. Returning to the campfire, we found nearly everyone, peculiar and Romani alike, gathered around Horace. He was standing on a tree stump before the astounded fortune teller, his eyes closed and one hand atop her head, and seemed to be narrating a dream as it came to him. And your grandson's grandson will pilot a giant ship that shuttles between the earth and the moon like an omnibus. And on the moon, he'll have a very small house, and he'll fall behind on the mortgage and have to take in lodgers. And one of those lodgers will be a beautiful woman, with whom he'll fall very deeply in moon love, which isn't quite the same as earth love because of the difference in gravity there. We watched from the edge of the crowd. Is he for real? I asked Emma. Might be, she replied, or he might just be having a bit of fun with her. Why can't he tell our futures like that? Emma shrugged. Horace's ability can be maddeningly useless. He'll reel off lifetimes of predictions for strangers, but with us he's almost totally blocked. It's as if the more he cares about someone, the less he can see. Emotion clouds his vision. Doesn't it all of us? came a voice from behind us, and we turned to see Enoch standing there. And on that tip, I hope you weren't distracting the American too much, Emma dear. It's hard to keep a lookout for hollow gas when there's a young lady's tongue in your ear. Don't be disgusting, Emma said. I couldn't ignore the feeling if I wanted to, I said, though I did wish I could ignore the icky feeling that Enoch was jealous of me. So... Tell me about your secret meeting, Enoch said. Did the Romani really protect us because of some dusty old alliance none of us have heard of? The leader and his wife have a peculiar son, said Emma. They hoped we could help him. That's madness, said Enoch. They nearly let themselves be filleted alive by those soldiers for the sake of one boy? Talk about emotion clouding vision. I figured they wanted to enslave us for our abilities, or at the very least sell us at auction. But then I'm always overestimating people. Oh, go find a dead animal to play with, said Emma. I'll never understand 99% of humanity, said Enoch, and he went away shaking his head. Sometimes I think that boy is part machine, Emma said. Flesh on the outside, metal on the inside. I laughed, but secretly I wondered if Enoch was right. Was it crazy? Would Bakir had risk for his son? Because if Bakir was crazy, then certainly I was. 
How much had I given up for the sake of just one girl? Despite my curiosity, despite my grandfather, despite the debts we owed Miss Peregrine, ultimately I was here, now, for one reason alone. Because from the day I met Emma, I'd known I wanted to be part of any world she belonged to. Did that make me crazy? Or was my heart too easily conquered? Maybe I could use a little metal on the inside, I thought. If I'd kept my heart better armored, where would I be now? Easy. I'd be at home, medicating myself into a monotone, drowning my sorrows in video games, working shifts at Smart Aid, dying inside day by day from regret. You coward! You weak, pathetic child! You threw your chance away! But I hadn't. In reaching towards Emma, I'd risked everything, was risking it again, every day. But in doing so, I had grasped and pulled myself into a world once unimaginable to me, where I lived among people who were more alive than anyone I'd known, did things I'd never dreamed I could do, survived things I'd never dreamed I could survive. All because I'd let myself feel something for one peculiar girl. Despite all the trouble and danger we found ourselves in, and despite the fact that this strange new world had started to crumble the moment I'd discovered it, I was profoundly glad I was here. Despite everything, this peculiar life was what I'd always wanted. Strange, I thought, how you can be living your dreams and your nightmares at the very same time. What is it? Emma said. You're staring at me. I wanted to thank you, I said. She wrinkled her nose and squinted like I'd said something funny. Thank me for what? She said. You give me strength I didn't know I had, I said. You make me better. She blushed. I don't know what to say. Emma, bright soul, I need your fire, the one inside you. You don't have to say anything, I said, and then I was seized with the sudden urge to kiss her, and I did. Though we were dead tired, the Romani were in a buoyant mood and seemed determined to keep the party going, and after a few cups of hot, sweet, highly caffeinated something and a few more songs, they'd won us over. They were natural storytellers and beautiful singers, innately charming people who treated us like long-lost cousins. We stayed up half the night trading stories. The young guy, who'd thrown his voice like a bear, did a ventriloquist act that was so good I almost believed his dummies had come alive. He seemed to have a little crush on Emma and delivered the whole routine to her, smiling encouragingly. But she pretended not to notice and made a point of holding my hand. Later, they told us the story of how, during the First World War, the British Army had taken all their horses, and for a while they'd had none to pull their wagons. They had been left stranded in the forest, this very forest, when one day a herd of long-horned goats wandered into their camp. They looked wild but were tame enough to eat out of your hand, so someone got the idea to hitch one to a wagon, and these goats turned out to be nearly as strong as the horses they'd lost. So the Romani got unstuck, and until the end of the war their wagons were pulled by these peculiarly strong goats, which is how they became known throughout Wales as goat people. As proof, they passed around a photo of Vakir's uncle riding a goat-pulled wagon. We knew without anyone having to say it, that this was the lost herd of peculiar goats Addison had talked about. After the war, the army gave back the Romani's horses, and the goats, no longer needed, disappeared again into the forest. Finally, campfires dwindling, they laid out sleeping rolls for us and sang a lullaby in a lilting foreign language, and I felt pleasantly like a child, the ventriloquist came to say goodnight to Emma. She shooed him away, but not before he left a calling card. 
On the back was an address in Cardiff where he picked up mail every few months whenever the Romani stopped through. On the front was his photo with dummies and a little note written to Emma. She showed it to me and snickered, but I felt bad for the guy. He was guilty only of liking her. Same as me. I curled up with Emma in a sleeping roll at the forest edge. Just as we were drifting off, I heard footsteps in the grass nearby and opened my eyes to see no one at all. It was Millard, back again after having spent the evening talking with the Roma boy. He wants to come with us, said Millard. Who? Emma mumbled groggily. Where? The boy, with us. And what did you say? I told him it was a bad idea, but I didn't say no precisely. You know we can't take on anyone else, Emma said. He'll slow us down. I know, I know, said Millard. But he's disappearing very rapidly, and he's frightened. Soon he'll be entirely invisible, and he's afraid he'll fall behind their group one day, and the Roma won't notice, and he'll be lost forever in the woods amongst the wolves and spiders. Emma groaned and rolled over to face Millard. He wasn't going to let her sleep until this was decided. I know he'll be disappointed, she said, but it's really impossible. I'm sorry, Mill. Fair enough, Millard said heavily. I'll give him the news. He rose and slipped away. Emma sighed, and for a while she tossed and turned, restless. You did the right thing, I whispered. It isn't easy being the one everybody looks to. She said nothing, but snuggled into the hollow of my chest. Gradually, we drifted off, the whispers of breeze-blown branches and the breathing of horses gentling us to sleep. It was a night of thin sleep and bad dreams, spent much as I'd spent the previous day, being chased by packs of nightmare dogs. By morning, I was worn out. My limbs felt heavy as wood, my head cottony. I might have felt better if I hadn't slept at all. Bakir woke us at dawn. Rise and shine, Sindragasti, he shouted, tossing out hunks of brick-hard bread. There'll be time for sleeping when you're dead. Enoch knocked his bread against a rock, and it clacked like wood. We'll be dead soon enough with breakfast like this. Bakir roughed Enoch's hair, grinning. Ah, come on. Where's your peculiar spirit this morning? In the wash, said Enoch covering his head with the sleeping roll. Bakir gave us ten minutes to prepare for the ride to town. He was making good on his promise and would have us there before the morning's first train. I got up, stumbled to a bucket of water, splashed some on my face, brushed my teeth with my finger. Oh, how I miss my toothbrush! How I long for my minty floss, my ocean breeze-scented deodorant stick, what I wouldn't have given, just then, to find a smart aid store. My kingdom for a pack of fresh underwear. As I raked bits of hay from my hair with my fingers and bit into a loaf of inedible bread, the Romani and their children watched us with mournful faces. It was as if they knew, somehow, that the previous night's fun had been a last hurrah, and now we were being led off to the gallows. I tried to cheer one of them up. It's okay, I said to a tow-headed little boy who seemed on the verge of tears. We're going to be fine. He looked at me as if he were talking to a ghost, his eyes wide and uncertain. Eight horses were rounded up, and eight Roma riders, one for each of us. Horses would get us to town much faster than a caravan of wagons could. They were also terrifying to me. I'd never ridden a horse. I was probably the only marginally rich kid in America who hadn't. It wasn't because I didn't think horses were beautiful, majestic creatures, the pinnacle of animal creation, etc., etc. It's just that I didn't believe any animal had the slightest interest 
in being mounted or ridden by a human being. Besides, horses were very large, and with rippling muscles and big, grinding teeth, and they looked at me as if they knew I was afraid and were hoping for an opportunity to kick my head in. Not to mention the lack of a seatbelt on a horse, no secondary restraint systems of any kind, and yet horses could go nearly as fast as cars, but were much bouncier. So the whole endeavor just seemed inadvisable. I said none of this, of course. I shut up and set my jaw and hoped I'd live at least long enough to die in a more interesting way than by falling off a horse. From the first giddy-up, we were at full gallop. I abandoned my dignity right away and bear-hugged the Roma man on the saddle in front of me who held the reins, so quickly that I didn't have a chance to wave goodbye to the Romani who had gathered to see us off. Which was just as well. Goodbyes had never been my strong suit anyway, and lately my life had felt like an unbroken series of them. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. We rode. My thighs went numb from squeezing the horse. Bakir led the pack, his peculiar boy riding with him in the saddle. The boy rode with his back straight and arms at his sides, confident and unafraid. Such a contrast from last night. He was in his element here, among the Romani. He didn't need us. These were his people. Eventually, we slowed to a trot, and I found the courage to unbury my face from the rider's jacket and take in the changing landscape. The forest had flattened into fields. We were descending into a valley, in the middle of which was a town that, from here, looked no bigger than a postage stamp, overwhelmed by green on all sides. Tracing towards it from the north was a long ellipses of puffy white dots, the smoky breath of a train. Bakir stopped the horses just shy of the town gates. This is as far as we go, he said. We're not much welcome in towns. You don't want the sort of attention we draw. It was hard to imagine anyone objecting to these kindly people. Then again, similar prejudices were among the reasons peculiars had withdrawn from society. Such was the way the sad world turned. The children and I dismounted. I stood behind the others, hoping no one would notice my trembling legs. Just as we were about to go, Vakir's boy sprang down from his father's horse and cried, Wait! Take me with you! I thought you were going to talk to him, Emma said to Millard. I did, Millard replied. The boy pulled a knapsack from the saddlebag and slung it over his shoulder. He was packed and ready to go. I can cook, he said, and chop wood and ride a horse and tie all sorts of knots. Someone give him a merit badge, said Enoch. I'm afraid it's impossible, Emma said to him gently. But I I'm like you and becoming more so all the time. The boy began to unbuckle his pants. Look what's happening to me. Before anyone could stop him, he'd sent his pants to his ankles. The girls gasped and looked away. Hugh shouted, Keep your trousers on, you depraved lunatic! But there was nothing to see. He was invisible from the midsection down. Morbid curiosity compelled me to peek at the underside of his visible half, which earned me a crystal-clear view of the inner workings of his bowels. Look how much I've disappeared since yesterday, Roddy said, his voice panicky. Soon I'll be gone altogether. The Roma men gawked and murmured. Even their horses seemed disturbed, shying away from what seemed to be a disembodied child. I'll be winged, said Enoch. He's only half there. Oh, you poor thing, said Bronwyn. Can't we keep him? We aren't some traveling circus you can join whenever the notion takes you, said Enoch. We're on a dangerous mission to save our Imbrin and in no position to play babysitter to a clueless new peculiar. The boy's eyes grew wide and began to water, and he let his knapsack slide off his shoulder 
and fall to the road. Emma took Enoch aside. That was too harsh, she said. Now tell him you're sorry. I won't. This is a ridiculous waste of our precious and dwindling time. These people saved our lives. Our lives wouldn't have needed saving if they hadn't stuck us in that blessed cage. Emma gave up on Enoch and turned to the boy. If circumstances were different, we'd welcome you with open arms. But as it stands, our entire civilization and way of life are in danger of being snuffed out. So it's rather bad timing, you see? It isn't fair, the boy moped. Why couldn't I have started disappearing ages ago? Why did it have to happen now? Every peculiar's ability manifests in its own time, said Millard. Some in infancy, others not until they're quite old. I once heard of a man who didn't realize he could levitate objects with his mind until he was ninety-two years of age. I was lighter than air from the minute I was born, Olive said proudly. I popped out of me mama and floated straight up to the hospital ceiling, only then that stopped me from rolling out the window and into the clouds was the umbilical cord. They say the doctor fainted from shock. You're still quite shocking, love, Bronwyn said, giving her a reassuring pat on the back. Millard, visible thanks to the coat and boots he wore, went to the boy. What does your father think of all this? he said. Naturally, we don't want him to go, Lakir said. But how can we properly care for our son if we can't even see him? He wants to leave, and I wonder if perhaps he'd be better off among his own kind. Do you love him? Millard asked bluntly. Does he love you? Lakir's brow furrowed. He was a man of traditional sensibilities, and the question made him uncomfortable. But after some hemming and hawing, he growled, Of course, he's my child. Then you are his kind, said Millard. The boy belongs with you, not us. Bakir was loath to show emotion in front of his men, but at this I saw his eyes flicker and his jaw tighten. He nodded, looked down at his son, and said, Come on then, pick up your bag and let's go. Your mother will have tea waiting. All right, Papa, the boy said, seeming at once disappointed and relieved. You'll be fine, Millard assured the boy. Better than fine, and when this is all over, I'll look for you. There are more like us out there, and we'll find them one day, together. Promise, the boy said, his eyes full of hope. I do, said Millard, and with that the boy climbed back onto his father's horse, and we turned and walked through the gates into town.